kind of a hard day to get up. I don't know if it was for you. It was Thanks. for on the, on the slide. I know. Anyway, um, you will, as usual, find our regular weekly announcements in a chair under you or near you on a little sheet of paper that, that tells you how you can worship this morning by giving. Um, talks a little bit about small groups. If you are interested in joining a small group, we would be glad to direct you in the right direction and maybe find one that fits you. Um, if you are a first time visitor, we ask, um, or if you have maybe a second or third time visitor and you just didn't do it last time, feel free to grab uh, a little mug off the, it's in the wrong, you know, in a different, I won't say the wrong place, a different place, but a table near the door, a round table near the door this week. A um, couple, couple other announcements for you. Um, there is a called conference next Sunday, um, it, referring to the, the, our upcoming missions project for the summer. There is a question and answer time about that mission project today from 1030 to 11 and from 12 to 1230 in Adult One. Uh, also, we begin this Sunday, um, we are starting Love at Last Sight. Studies for Love at Last Sight, small group studies will begin next Sunday and then the following Wednesday. Um, they'll be taught by Jason Cogdell on Sunday evenings and with some little help, I think he's gonna have some help with that. And on Wednesday evenings over in or near the coffee house and Karen Valentine will be teaching that, that small group. And so we invite you, if you are interested to sign up on the, out in the Welcome Center there, there's a couple of sign up sheets we would love for you to sign up for one of those classes and books should be in the office by Tuesday at the latest, I understand. So um, if you haven't got a book and started reading, don't feel bad because nobody has. So <laughs> they will be here by Tuesday and you can pick those up and you will, you will not be um, horribly behind. So we're gonna continue worship this morning. I'm so glad that y'all managed to get out of bed and to be here this morning. And uh, I am glad to be in this place worshiping with you. And I'm going to invite you to stand again if you feel comfortable as we sing um, about God's glory. <laughs>
said, we're starting Love at Last Sight. So, Love at Last Sight is all about relationships. Don't get too comfortable, people. <laughs> it's all about relationships. So, in this room is any multitude of number of relationships, some of which, for you, are already close relationships, some of which are maybe brand new relationships or relationships yet to be formed. So here is your task for, for just a moment. I want you to look at one person with whom you have a close relationship and express to them what that means to you. And then I want you to meet someone and form a new relationship. Ooh, <laughs> so that will require movement and action on your part. So <laughs> this is your invitation.
at last sight. Go, oh, wow. Okay. Never heard of that. Pardon? Black Widow Spider. Ooh. That's not what we're going to be talking about. <laughs> not going to be talking about Black Widow Spider. We are going to be talking about relationships. Relationships. And how we develop strong relationships. This is a different feel. You don't have a center aisle here. It's amazing. We've never done this before. It's a Baptist church. What do people think? Uh, and, and, and as I got to thinking about relationships, it, and as we're kind of writing the other night, sitting there kind of getting thoughts together, this happened on one of those uh, shows that come on about 6, 7 o'clock at night, Hollywood Insider or Inside Edition or one of the, the, the trash shows <laughs> that comes in that tells us about the latest marriage in Hollywood that lasted a sum total of, you know, 12 days or something. And I was sitting there going, you know, really? I mean, is that it? Is that, is that all we got that we can put on the news? And, and the, it's just symptomatic. I think it's just symptomatic of the fact that, that we see relationships as disposable. And it kind of raises the question in my mind, in my mind you know, can we have marriages that, that make the test of time, that, that last the test of time? Do we have marriages that can do that? Do we have friendships that can do that? And more specifically about marriage, what do we do? Can love last? What do we do when the sizzle fizzles? That can be a subtitle for, for today's sermon, okay? And, and, and can you really build relationships that, that are closer the last time you see someone than they were the first time you see someone? Does that make sense? So we're beginning this brand new series, and I think that it can lead us to a point where it, it strengthens our relationship with one another, within our marriages, within our friendships, within our church. So we're calling it Love at Last Sight. Uh, and, and hopefully in the next 30 days, as we kind of walk through some of these things together, it can be an adventure for you. You know, you can learn how to deepen your closest relationships, deeper than you ever thought possible. And so we'll kind of call it a Love at Last Sight Challenge. I mean, we'll just kind of group together and make this a challenge that we work on together. And, and in a day where, where people wonder, can relationships last, whatever the nature of they are, the, the, they are can, can they last? In that kind of day, I believe we can say yes. As the, as the body of Christ, we are determined that the relationships we form are going to be strong. They're going to be the kind that we work on together. If, for those of you that are not married, for those of you who are not married, I want, to, want you to remember the story of the eagle. I don't know if y'all have heard this, um, but it, it's actually true. Eagles, in their courting relationship, play this kind of a game of tag. Uh, humans do too, but, but, <laughs> but eagles more specifically play this very specific kind, kind of tag. The male and the female eagles, they chase each other around for days until the female gets tired of that and she wants to play a new game. Uh, a game that, that eagles have been playing for centuries. And the way it goes is this. She will swoop down and pick up a small stick with her talons, and then she'll fly up somewhere between eight and 10,000 feet and start flying in figure eights, okay, until the male comes up and, and starts following her. Well, then she'll drop the stick, and if the male being a gentleman, you know, if he is, he will swoop down and snag the stick out of midair and take it back up to her. And, of course, she's not interested. <laughs> now on that stick swoops down again she picks up a larger stick and then she flies up to about 5,000 feet and starts doing figure eights okay and she'll drop that larger stick and, and the male has to drop the stick he has swoop down and grab that stick and on and on it goes until eventually she's down flying around at about 500 feet above the ground and, and she basically drops a log you know, and, and, the, and the male eagle's got to catch it. And it, if at any time he fails to catch the stick that she drops, she chases him away. I'm going to get out of here. Get out of my sight. She chases him away. But if he's proved that he's a good husband and can catch all the sticks, then, then, <laughs> then they, they take their vows together. And the way that they do this is they fly up between 10 and 15,000 feet, and then they, well, we'll let you see what they do. If you will Google search those images, they, they, they clasp talons and they just kind of spiral down. There's actually, in, in one of the top five or six hits on Google, where they didn't let go in time. Yeah, yeah, and they hit the ground, boom! You know, and, and one of them died and the other one they had nursed back to hell. But that's, I mean, it, it's a quite spectacular 
thinking they'd be doing and, and I've never seen it live, although I asked the people at Dollywood about it, they've got a bald eagle refuge up there, and they said, yeah, actually, you know, we, we've seen that happen. We've seen them not hit the ground, but we've seen them actually, actually do the courtship thing. And, and if you think about it, that kind of puts to shame our long, drawn-out human weddings, doesn't it? You know, that's a lot more spectacular than what we do in human weddings. But these eagles, they, they take their vows together, and then they remain together for life. So death do their part. So, so what is the lesson that we learn from the eagles and their courting? And guys, it's not you can't please a woman, okay? That's, that's, that's not it. That's not the answer. The, the lesson, I think, <laughs> we need a testimonial like that. <laughs> the lesson is, I believe, that relationships should be valued above all else. That's the nature of who we are as humans. It's about relationship. Relationships of trust with God and with each other. So that's where we are. And, and because of the eagle illustration, you know, in our thinking, we probably jump automatically to kind of the marriage relationships, and, that, and that's natural. But we should also protect and treasure all of our relationships, all of our friendships. Love unconditionally and accept each other completely. And you say, okay, well, that's fine, Raymond, but what do you do if a young lady comes to you and says, Raymond, I'm dating this guy, and he's got all of these issues, but I know that God wants me to love him unconditionally and to marry him. What would you say? I'd say, huh, God doesn't want you to. God probably wants you to dump this guy. Because God, God wants the best for you, so lose the loser. All right? And, and I sound like a dad when I'm saying that, don't I? <laughs> I really do. It kind of fine with a 16-year-old daughter. Um, but, but, but I would say the same thing to, to a young man in similar circumstances, which, you know, understand, this, this, this brings us to kind of a distinction in relationship. Understand what I'm saying clearly. I'm not saying we shouldn't love people. What, what I'm saying is we should love all people unconditionally, yes. As God loves us, yes. But that does not mean that we should en enable them by blindly approving of sinful or destructive lifestyles. Do you get the difference? You know, and when you marry someone, you're basically giving your approval to their behaviors. Like it or not, that's what you're saying. So we all have faults. Nobody's perfect. We all have our struggles. We all have our weaknesses. But once you say those marriage vows, you are, you are saying that you will love unconditionally, completely, and, and you're asking God for the power to love in that fashion. Does that make sense? You understand the distinction? Okay. Only God can help us do that, too. Understand, only God can help us do that. I think that's really the lesson of the eagle. Okay? So it's important to remember, because we're going to go through three stages here. I, I've kind of grossly oversimplified, so don't go and say, where my book is that in? I've grossly over, oversimplified, but we go through stages, especially in marriage relationships, where the stage one, we'll call it love at first sight. Oh, I just love him. Yeah, it, and, and it has more to do with infatuation than it does reality most of the time. It really does. And, and, and I think a lot of couples enter marriage still in that infatuation stage. And it's cute. I mean, it is. It really is. And, and in that infatuation stage, the unity candle is burning brightly. Matter of fact, it's burning so hot, you need a whole pack of unity candles just to handle the heat. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so, I mean, and, and that's sweet. And, it, and it's in this stage that, that all of a sudden, you, you're, you're just so much alike. You know, he likes pizza. I like pizza. He has two eyes. I have two eyes. He has two ears. I have, we're just perfect for each other. We're just the light. I have found the perfect guy. I have found the perfect girl. That's the infatuation stage. You go from that into the second look stage. Okay? The second look is a little bit more discriminating. And all of a sudden, in the second look, you go, they're not like me at all. Matter of fact, they're just the opposite of me. And I really don't like their annoying habits. And you begin to make a list of all their annoying habits. You go, I, I just, how in the world did I get along with this person to begin with? And if we're not careful, we begin to obsess about the differences that we've discovered, and it extinguishes the whole box of unity candles. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 and I think, you know, it, it's a natural part of a maturing relationship, but we can't obsess of that. We, it's how we react to discovering those differences and learning how, they're not being hard to get along with, they're just being who God created them to be, and we learn to appreciate that. Whether well, particularly like it or not, we learn to appreciate that that's how God made them to be. The third stage is what we're going to call the last sight stage. 
You know, every marriage, I think, has a last sight, and, and every relationship has a last sight. The question is, will it be love at last sight, or will it be don't let the door hit you <laughs> sight, okay? That's the question. And, and as we look at relationships, you know, the title for the series, Love at Last Sight, is because we want every relationship to be love at last sight. Because I'm not sure how many can really experience, how many have, have experienced love at first sight, but I believe every relationship can be love at last sight. Make sense? Okay, we'll move on. This series is for everyone. The next four weeks, this is for everyone. If you're single, I think you need to, to, to know how to move from infatuation to the real deal. If you're married, you need to know how to build a lasting relationship, one that, that, that allows you to continue to have that romantic fire alive in your relationship while accepting one another's differences. So whether it's a relationship with family or friends, you need to learn how to really connect how to have a great relationship. Great relationships are not just about initial attraction. Relationships are about investments of time and energy and the bad times as well as the good times. Amen? Okay, we gotta be both. And it's kind of ironic though. If you look at our culture right now, it's very ironic. We are more technologically advanced than any, than any civilization. And through sites like Facebook and Twitter, you know, we are more connected to each other than ever before. So why is it, with all of our connection, relationships are suffering in such a big way? You can have 500 friends on Facebook, but not one friend that you talk to face to face. You see, for, for all of the social networking, and I'm not slamming social networking, <clears throat> you know that we use <coughs> Facebook to promote this this service, you know, we, we have Facebook pages for the youth. I mean, it, it's a good way to communicate, but, but we cannot turn technology into a substitute for real relationships. I guess that's what I'm saying. You, we have to continue to have the face time, sit down and spending time with people, talking face to face, quality time, getting to know them, not just typing out some words, all right? So love is, is what you develop from those face to face times. Love is what you develop through working through things together. And love at last sight, the love at last sight challenge will, will put, put into your path practical skills, hopefully, that will allow you to experience deeper, more meaningful relationships. That's our goal in the next four weeks. So if you're going to do that, if you're going to accomplish that goal, I think we kind of need a theme verse. If, if all else fails, we need scripture, right? So I, I've chosen Ephesians chapter 5. Verses 1 and 2. And I didn't mean if all else failed. That was a joke, right? Ephesians chapter 5. Let me go away. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. You see, the highest goal that we can have this side of heaven is to love like Christ. That's, that's a lifelong journey. It's growing. It's developing rich, meaningful relationships. Because you've heard me say this before, but it's true. Relationship is all that you take from here. Everything else is going to burn. Relationship is all that we take with us to heaven. So this should be what we're doing, working on relationships. Jesus showed us how to do it. For three and a half years, his public ministry, we know how, how to develop a life of love because we watched him. That, that's why we're told about in this passage that Paul wrote, follow the example of Christ. Learn to live a life of love, a love that lasts. And, and he paints this portrait of what God would have relationships look like. Relationships are an art. And, and the master artist offers to us the clearest picture of love in the person of Jesus Christ, how he lived his life. So when you look at his life, his character, and the relationships that he shared with his, his father and with other people, you know, you see a perfect picture of love. So let's take a look at that picture for just a few minutes. We're going to demonstrate, we're going to see how love demonstrates four arts that we'll be studying over the next four weeks, okay? So this is a preview, all right? Four arts. First art is the art of being all there. Being all there. No. 
Not, not in the psychosis sense. Okay? Being all there is in ever present in the relationship. The Bible tells us that Jesus is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That's right. So you'll never have to worry about Jesus not being all there for you. That's what he's saying. When you call out to him, he's all there for you. Following his death and resurrection, he gave this assurance to his disciples. He said in Matthew 28, 20, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He wanted them he wanted us to know, be sure of this, so that, that, that as, as we go through our life, as we build a relationship, we would never doubt his full presence with us, okay? So, so during our Love at Last Sight, next week, we're going to give you a practical tool, if you would like one. Uh, you know the wristbands are so popular today. We have a fashionable orange one to add to your list, um, or add to your wrist, either one. Um, and, and it says on it, quite simply, be all there. And, and it's going to be a reminder to me, and I hope it will be a reminder to you if you choose to wear one, that no matter what relationship you're in, be all there. When you're physically present, be fully present and engaged in that relationship. That's one of the things we're going to work on. The second art in, in Love at Last Sight is the art of acting intentionally. No one was ever more intentional than Jesus. No one. He knew exactly why he came to earth. He knew what his mission was. It was to save and reach a lost and dying world that was separated from God. He, he not only had good intentions for us, but he acted very intentionally. The Bible tells us in Luke 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who were lost. His mission, quite frankly, was to seek and to save. He knew that we were too lost to find our way to God, so he came to reveal himself to us. And that's what real love is. He demonstrated his love intentionally by serving. Look at Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus was intentional in his mission. When his disciples, when other people wanted to kind of promote him out there as some sort of, of earthly king, he said, I wouldn't have any part of it. Not once did he get distracted from his mission of love. He, he, didn't, he didn't pull it off, you know, pull off of that or get preoccupied with other things. And, and the resolve that Jesus showed teaches me to act intentionally. I want my relationships to experience a love like his. He teaches me, take the first step in reaching out to others. Don't wait on them to come to me. Take the first step. Serve them. Find some act of kindness that demonstrates my love for them. And, and, and don't, don't get distracted. Do not get distracted or preoccupied. Give my full attention. Did you see the testimonial on Facebook that I posted? Oh, shit, was it on? That was on the, on the website. There, there's a kind of promotional um, uh, video that's on, on the website, recreation website. Go back and look at that. It's under the video of the week thing on the image, image update and video page. Go look at that. It's, it's kind of interesting to see what a simple act of kindness can do. Love at last sight is a love like Jesus, intentionally giving acts of kindness and love. The third art in love at last sight is the art of risking, risking awkwardness. No other love, hear this clearly, no other love risks more awkwardness than Christ's love. Can you imagine God becoming man? How awkward is that? God became man. The, the infinite, all-powerful creator clothed himself in the frailty of human flesh. <coughs> That's what he did. John 1, 14 says it pretty clearly. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory. The glory of the Father's one and only Son. But because Jesus took that risk, we get a clear picture of what God looks like. The, the clearest picture the world has ever seen of God is the person of Jesus Christ. He's God in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, Without question, 
This is the great mystery of our faith. That Christ was revealed in a human body. And I personally am so thankful that Jesus risked the awkwardness of coming to my world so that I can have the opportunity to go to his. You know, I, because he, he risked, his love risked the awkwardness of coming here. We have a bridge to heaven. His love teaches me to risk awkwardness in my relationships with others. Say, well, that's just so awkward to try to, sorry, no excuses. No excuses. It teaches me that the reward is greater than the risk when I risk. So in Love at Last Sight, you're going to learn the, the art of, of risking awkwardness and, and experience the breakthroughs in the, in the closest relationships and how they'll grow and they'll deepen. The last art that we're going to look at, which will be four or five, four weeks from today, is the art of letting go. And for me personally, this is probably the toughest art to master. You know, the love at last sight, you know, the, the art of letting go is tough because to love like Christ, I have to learn to let go of some of the things that prevented my relationships from being all that God wanted it to be. So when you look at the, the life of Christ close enough, you see some of these things. You see some things that he released to dem demonstrate God's love for us. One of the most profound rights that he gave up was his, his right to divine privilege. Look at Philippians 2, verses 6 and 7. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privilege. Privileges. Have you ever thought about it that way? He gave up his divine privilege. Think, Jesus loved you and I so much, he gave up those privileges. He could have remained in heaven with God the Father, but he loved us so much, he released those privileges and came to serve us. Came to serve us and to ransom us from our sin. I cannot, I cannot fathom that kind of love. I can't do it. Jesus also let go of the hurt that others had inflicted on him. You know this verse, but hear it again. Luke 23. When they came to a place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross, and the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, get this, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I cannot fathom that kind of love. But as a follower of Christ, I am called to imitate it. Yeah, I'm called to imitate it. But if I want to love like Christ, there's some things I've got to let go of. I've got to let go of my rights. I have to let go of control. I have to let go of hurt. I have to let go of insecurity. I have to let go of pride. I have to let go of guilt. I have to let go of selfishness. I have to let go of unrealistic expectations. I have to let go of the past. And there's probably a hundred other things that i got to let go of. This was just the first nine that came to my mind. And the only way that I can successfully let go of all those things is to take hold of Christ. I need his presence. I need his power in my life if I'm going to live a life of love. And that's why love at last sight is a lifelong journey. You will never master it this side of heaven. But each day you can grow and you will experience stronger and deeper, more meaningful relationships. Back to our key verse. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. So when I follow that example, I learn to let go of my selfishness and instead serve others. I want to live that kind of life. Search your heart today. Open it up. Let, let God show you how he wants you to live out that kind of love. Let him reveal to you his kind of love and what that means in your relationship. Let's pray and ask him for it. Gracious Father, we thank you for the fact that you gave us in Jesus Christ the perfect example of how to live. Father, we confess to you that we have not done that. In our human weakness, we have not done that. But Father, we pray that we would not use our weakness as an excuse, but instead that we would claim the promises of Christ, that we would claim the power of Christ in our own lives.
so that the relationships that we have would be deepened. The relationships that we are forming would be strengthened. And those, those relationships that we've had for a long period of time, Father, would, would be rekindled. And we would begin to, to understand what it means to truly love as you love us. God, we thank you. We thank you for this, this congregation of believers who have come together this morning to worship uh, and to learn. And Father, we pray that as we go into the next four weeks, that it would truly strengthen not only our relationships with one another, but it would, it would, it would just spread out into this community. And people would say, hey, I want to be a part of that body of Christ that's growing on the corner of Polo and Ransom God, we love you. We pray for your strength and we pray for your help. Of course, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today, we're going to dismiss, not by having a song, but allowing the opportunity to speak to one another and then go.